We'll open your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 26. We're going to take a lesson from there tonight. 2 Chronicles 26. <clears throat> I have several visitors here tonight. We appreciate you being here. I know you're probably visiting in some degree to being Mother's Day, but we do appreciate you being here and we encourage you back at any opportunity you have a chance to worship with us. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about a lesson. I believe it's a good reminder for all of us. Uh, we talk about a lesson about a king who, in his reign as it began, started out just about as good as anybody's reign as king could ever do so. But after he got to a certain point in his life, after he finally got to a certain level of, of authority and success and power as a king, that very, very quickly changed. And it went downhill and it went downhill really, really fast. And as we think about that tonight in this lesson, I'm, I'm mindful of what Isaiah said in Isaiah 42 and in verse 8. God said to him, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another nor my praise to carved images. We talked a lot about, or at least in some degree, we've talked about idols here lately and, and what could be represented as that idol, and, and really it's anything that could come between us and God. But one of those things that definitely could come between us and our relationship with God is our pride and our arrogance in the fact that maybe sometimes we think maybe we have accomplished these things when really it's, it's God and all the glory has to go to Him. God through Isaiah doesn't make any bones about it. He says, I will not give my glory to another. There's no exception to where he does. There's no exception to where he will. And there's no exception to where that's okay if we allow his glory to go elsewhere. And God can lose his glory in a lot of different ways and, and, and by the way that we live our lives and different things in this life. But at the end of the day, he deserves the glory and nobody else ultimately truly does. And if we're going to be pleasing to God, if we're going to live lives that are pleasing to Him, then we have to make sure that that glory goes to Him. As the reign of Uzziah opens up, it opened up very, very well. And following along there in 2 Corinthians, or 2 Chronicles rather, uh, 26, beginning there in, in verse 1, we kind of see how things opened up with him. And what I want to do is, as we begin the lesson tonight is go ahead and read through the first 15 verses and then really the rest of the lesson only deals with about three or four verses. And we'll kind of focus on that as we go through the rest of the night. But I want you to notice his accomplishments and how, how well he's doing. St. Chronicles 26, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah, and after the king rested with after that is the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was sixteen years old when he became king. He reigned fifty-two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He did what was right, and that's why God blessed him. Notice verse 5, He sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the vision of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Now, when you really start looking at the rest of verses uh, 7 or 8 through 15, you, you really get the whole gist of what takes place here. Some of the accomplishments that he was able to do, he became exceedingly strong. Uh, his fame spread as far as Egypt. He built fortified towers. Uh, he dug wells in the desert, which was a challenging thing because obviously they would have to be to some degree deeper. And he built, starting there in verse 11, going through verse 15, he built a massive army. Uh, just notice some of these. I, I kind of jotted some of these things down just to save us a little bit of time in that reading. But notice what it says. The massive army consisted of a regiment of mighty warriors commanded by 2,600 chief officers, the army consisted of 307,500 men, and all of them were elite troops. He provided the entire army with shields, spears, helmets, coats of mail, bows and slings and stones. And this is what's really impressive. As you get down into verse 14 and 15, it says that he built structures on the walls of Jerusalem designed by experts to protect those who shot arrows, and they would hurl large stones from the towers from the corners of the wall. This guy was really ahead of his times in what he was doing. 
And in verse 15 it says that his fame spread far and wide for he was marvelously helped to the point that he became strong. He was marvelously helped to the point that he became strong. We know who's behind that helping. And who was behind that helping was God. Until he became strong, God did everything that he could for Uzziah, namely because he gave God the glory, and he did what God wanted him to do, and God blessed his kingdom, and he set him up in a much greater fashion than really Judah had been in quite some time. Why would you think a lesson about to God be the glory would be about the life of Uzziah? When you read those first few verses, and I don't know how long that may have consisted of, but at least quite some time, he seems like he's got everything worked out. He seems as if he's got all of his, all of his ducks in a row, so to speak, and he is doing things God's way, and if you had that interpretation, you'd be exactly right. But I guess one lesson we need to bring out from this, and what we need to remember is that We've got to finish what we've started in this life. Sometimes it's said it's not how you start, it's how you finish. I don't know if I fully agree with that. You do have to start in a good way, it's, or at least it's helpful to do so. But I do agree for sure with the finishing part. We have got to finish what we started for God. And it seems that in Uzziah's life, he did not do that. He started off very well, as many times we do. Sometimes in our lives as Christians, we start off full of zeal. We start off full of encouragement. We start off with, with all the attitudes that we need to exemplify as Christians, and we're going down the right path. But somewhere along the way, something gets in the way. And what that something is tonight is ourselves. Pride got in the way of Uzziah. And when pride enters the picture, and when we become centered on self rather than centered on God, we've got a huge issue. And we're going to see how that brought the downfall of Uzziah and how really, as, as bad as his life became, he never seemed to change. You know, sometimes God gives us warnings. He kind of gives us some signs to say, hey, you know, wake up. You, you need to change how you're acting. But it seems as if he never picked up on it or he didn't carry the one. But God deserves the glory and he will never, never settle for second place. I ask you tonight before we go into this lesson and get deep into it, just how serious are you, how serious are we in making sure that we give God glory? Because He demands it. And we better be giving it to Him, and if we're not, sooner or later we're going to have to pay the price. Let's consider Uzziah and some telltale signs of the fact that maybe our glory is not going to God, whereas it could be going to someone else. The first thing that kind of jumps out to me as we look at 2 Chronicles 26, and we're going to read verse 16, is the fact that Sometimes in life, I mean, we, we face enough battles on the outside. The Bible tells us that we face all kinds of battles with, with powers and principalities, things on the outside. We talk about that we have to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. All that's important because we are facing those outward battles every day. But sometimes they turn into inward battles, maybe not so much with evil, but with ourselves with the pride and what our desires are and what, what drives us and what motivates us to do whatever we're doing in life. And it seems that that's kind of what took place in Uzziah's life. Notice what it says there in verse 16. Second Chronicles 26 and in verse 16. It says, When he was strong, his heart was lifted up. Now, again, verse 15 ends, The Lord helped him, and he was very prosperous until he became strong. So he got to the point that he was strong, and then when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his own destruction. Well, there you go. I've seen in, in my course of the work environment and working with all different sorts of people over the years, some people just can't handle power and authority. Some people can't handle its success. You see it in, in the sports world. You see how people come up very respectful, very well-mannered, uh, always mindful of other people, and they become successful, and they become uh, good at their craft or their trade or their sport or whatever it may be. And then later in life, you see them, and they're a completely different person. How does that happen? Well, it's because they become centered on themselves and what they've done. They begin to feel entitled, and they forget that humble place that they came from. They forget those meek beginnings of where they got to start. And it seems as if Uzziah has forgot the same thing because when it says, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his own destruction. And notice what he did. He transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So look at what happens here. 
What he does is literally goes against the very principles that God has laid out. What's happening here is that his inward battle for pride is resulting for an, an outward quest of self. He knew he had no business being a priest. He had no authority to do that. He may have been king. He may have had a lot of success. But what the priests were supposed to do was to be left up to the priests. But yet he had become so successful in all other assets of life, in all other aspects of life, he thought, well, why can't I be priest too? I'm doing all these other things. I'll just take that over too. It was an inward battle with pride that he had going on. And sometimes when our inward battles that we create our own selves becomes stronger than the ones that we already face by default on the outside, we've got a huge issue. And it was with Uzziah in his life because he really thought himself to be something. And that was the beginning of his downfall. In Genesis chapter 4, verses 5 through 7, we see one of those inward battles. And where Cain was struggling with that inner battle with his brother, of the jealousy, of the anger, of the resentment, and again, feeling as if he should be accepted. Really, it was about himself. He, he wanted to be accepted in God's eyes and do it his way. And isn't it interesting how God, when he questions him, he says, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? What's going on inside of you, Cain? What kind of battle is going on with you? You see, God knows what we're going through, and He knows what we're struggling with on the inside. And He even kind of gave Him a little subtle warning there to say, look, sin lies at the door and its desires for you, but you have to rule over it. What He's telling Cain is, Cain, you've got to get over this. It's going to eat at you, it's going to change you, and it's going to ruin you. You've got to, you've got to deal with this problem. You've got to face it. Seems as if He never did. Oh, he dealt with it, but he dealt with it in the wrong way, and we know that he rose up and he slew his brother. Those inward battles of pride are full of vanity. And it will get us every time. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 through 20, Paul says, I know what's in me. I know what's in my flesh. And he said, what's inside of my flesh, nothing good dwells. And he says, I know what I need to do. And when you think about it, <laughs> if anybody understood what they needed to do at that time, it was Paul. Because he had spent some very unique time with Christ when he was, was called away that three-year period, not, not long after he was baptized. Those things that were revealed to him, those things that he saw, those things that he experienced. He saw a lot. He was taught a lot. He knew God's will. He knew Christ's will because he had spoke directly to him in a much different way than he'd done any of the other apostles. So when Paul said, I know what I'm supposed to do, I know what the will of God is, that was a true statement. He knew what he needed to do. But what he admitted on the inside was that that's exactly what I end up not doing. And a lot of times we, we may ask our kids that, you know, we, we'll get under our children you know, and we'll say, why did you do that? You knew you weren't supposed to do that. And a lot of times their answer is, I don't know. You know why they answer that way? Because it's just like us. <laughs> Sometimes we don't. I mean, why do we do what we know we shouldn't do? We're just, we're just weak human beings. But what Paul is really getting at there is that there's a battle inside of me with self that sometimes I lose. And what he goes on to realize and goes on to quote in that passage there in Romans chapter 7 is that the only thing to overcome that is the power of Christ and the power of God through Christ. He's always fighting a, an inward battle that sometimes we all face. The problem with his eye is he never turned the right direction and he continued to spiral down here. If your inward battles with self and with pride becomes larger than the ones on the outside that you should be fighting against evil, you got a problem. And that was his problem. I'll tell you something else that got him as well. When more attention falls on the one who is building the kingdom rather than the kingdom of the Lord's, you got a problem. Sometimes we get so caught up in, in our agenda. Sometimes we get so caught up in the things that, that we want to do to establish self and to promote self and to broaden our phylacteries, if you will, and accomplish what we want to accomplish in this life. But I want to tell you something. Our agenda and our desires should never take the driver's seat and push God away from the wheel. When we do that, we're in trouble. And that's exactly what happened to King Uzziah. 
It's so easy to become consumed with our goals, with our ambitions, with our wants and our desires, but sooner or later, we have to sit back and think, okay, who allowed us this ability? Who gave us this opportunity? Yes, I may have worked hard. Yes, I may have done this. Yes, I may have accomplished that. But who gave me that ability? It seems as if Uzziah never did that, and it was all about me, 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 I, 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 look what I've done. But again, you have to be careful as to who becomes king in your life. There was another king who struggled with that. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And he was even warned about it in Daniel chapter 4. Just earlier before that, he was warned, you, don't, you need to get rid of this pride. You're not as good as you think you are. You need to be humble. And you turn right around in Daniel chapter 4 at the end of 12 months. He was walking by in the royal palace of Babylon. And he looked out over Babylon. And, and of course, there was just some amazing things that, that were going on there. Some beautiful things, some beautiful gardens, some beautiful statues, some beautiful constructions that had been made. And he looks out over all that, and his nose goes up in the air, and he takes a deep breath, and he says, Is this not the great kingdom that I have built? What happened to it? Well, the context of that passage goes on to say, While the words were still in his mouth, God struck him. He struck him, and he went from being a powerful king of Babylon to eating grass like an oxen. He grew feathers like, a, like an eagle. And, and I, I've got a sermon on that that I've done before. And I've looked up some pictures on it. And to have somebody kind of paint a picture of that is, is, an, is an amazing scene. Of how you go from king to walking on all fours, eating grass. So you're part oxen, you're part bird. That's a weird looking creature. And you may think, well, why did God do that to him? Because his glory doesn't go to anyone else. Nebuchadnezzar thought Nebuchadnezzar was the builder of the kingdom. God had propped him up. God had used him for a specific purpose. It had nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar. Uzziah's kingdom had nothing to do with Uzziah. But he sure thought it. Do we understand that? Do we understand that any success that we have in this life, that that credit, that credit has to go to God? Our friends, when it doesn't, we've got a problem. As we often remember from Proverbs 16 and verse 18, pride goes before destruction and the haughty spirit before a fall. Pride, haughtiness, it'll destroy you. God says, I won't share my glory. It's got to go to me. And if we fail to remember that, we'll be no different than King Uzziah or King Nebuchadnezzar. I tell you, there's also another warning sign and a telltale sign that maybe we're going down a dangerous path, and that is when the Lord's help is no longer considered essential. When we get to the point in life that, that we think we can go it alone and that we've got life figured out and we've, we've got it by the horn, so to speak, we've, we've got a problem. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, notice there at the bottom of verse 16, again, he's burning incense on the altar of incense. Why is he doing that? Why is he acting as priest? It goes on in verse 17, As Azariah, the priest, went in after him, and with him were eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah and said, It's not good for you to do this, to burn incense. In other words, they're saying, You don't have to do this. As a matter of fact, if you want to reach God, if you want to be pleasing to God, you need to stop this. You'll never reach God yourself. You're not a priest. He didn't give you that position. He didn't give you that authority. So you need to rely on the ones who are put in place to do that if you want to reach God. But in his mind, similar to that of King Saul at one point in his life, he didn't think he needed them. He thought he had arrived, if you will, in life, and he didn't need God's help. He didn't need the priest's help. He's just going to do his own thing. He's almost acting as if he's God here and overstepping every bound that had been put in place years before he was ever in power. After all, think about it. I mean, you got to give him the benefit of the doubt. He was strong, right? The, the passage literally tells us that. He was strong. When we're strong, when we've got life by the horns, when we have plenty of authority or plenty say-so, and when we have plenty of money, and when we built ourselves up houses, and when we have everything that we need, why, why do we need God? I mean, we've done all this. Why do we need God? Well, we know why. Sometimes we forget, don't we? He forgot, and it cost him dearly. 
So did King Saul. Same thing with him. 1 Chronicles 10, 13 through 14, Saul died for his unfaithfulness which he committed against the Lord because he didn't keep God's word. There was times he acted as priest because he didn't want to wait around on Samuel. There was times when he consulted a medium rather than consulting in God. He knew better. Isn't it amazing? You go back in the life of Saul, when he was first chosen to be king, he fought against that. Sometimes we forget that. Saul stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He was handsome. He was, he was attractive. He fit the mold for king, head and shoulders above everybody else. But he, he didn't think he was a guy for the job. And he looked at Samuel when he came to him and he said, Why are you talking to me like this? I'm of the smallest tribe of Benjamin, of, of all of Israel. I'm of the smallest tribe. you got all these other choices, all these other tribes, all these other people. Why are you choosing me? Why are you talking to me like this? Almost as if to say like Moses did, Don't choose me, choose somebody else. That was King Saul. He was very humble. But when Saul became king and when he became powerful, all that pride went to his heart. And you know what happened? God killed him because of it. That, that's a violent verse. Because he did not inquire of the Lord, because he did not give God the glory, because he didn't seek to do it God's way, God just didn't remove him from king. God killed him. One of the scariest verses in God's Word is where it talks about where the Spirit of the Lord left Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord entered him. I don't know at what point that happens in life, but I know I never want to get there. But if you push God out long enough, in pride, if you shove Him out of your life long enough, guess what's going to happen eventually? He's going to say, okay, I get the picture. You don't want me here. I'll leave. And when He leaves, all manners of evil will come in. That's what happened to Saul. That's what happened to King Zion. But it didn't seem to slow him down, did it? 2 Kings 18 and verse 21, And Sennacherib's boast, which Sennacherib, king of Assyria, he was a vile, evil person anyway. But what he said was really right. He told Israel, he told God's people, he said, Look, you, you, know, you, you need to bow down to me because I'm going to take you over anyway. He also goes on to say you shouldn't trust in God because he's not going to help you, which was wrong. But he was right in what he said here. He said in 2 Kings 18 and verse 21, You're trusting in the staff of this broken reed, Egypt for which if you lean on it, it'll fall and break and the splinters will go in your hand, go in your arm. It's a useless trust. Oh, he was right. Because Egypt couldn't help. But neither can either things that we oftentimes trust in. But here's the point. When we believe that the Lord's help is no longer essential, we're in for a world of hurt. Pride will make you think that way. Pride will make you think that you don't need God's help. But my friends, we surely do. Another thing that really jumps out about this story is that when proofs and when reproofs and warnings kind of fall on deaf ears. I stopped reading there in verse 17, but look back there. I actually stopped in verse 18, but look there. Again, Azariah the priest goes in after him. Eighty priests of the Lord, they're all valiant men. They go in, they go to King Uzziah, and they say, It is not good for you to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron. This is who should do this, who are consecrated to burn incense. King Uzziah, get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed, and you shall have no honor from the Lord of God. And how did he respond to that? In verse 19, he became furious, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense, and while he was angry with the priests, it's almost like it was with King Nebuchadnezzar. While he was in the moment of his anger and his fury and his pride, leprosy broke out on him, on his forehead before the priests, and besides the incense of all. It goes on in verse 20 to say, And Azariah the chief priest and all the priests looked at him, and there on his forehead he was leprous, so they thrust him out of that place. Indeed, he also hurried to get out because the Lord struck him, and he was a leper until the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, and he was cut off from the house of the Lord forever. And his life, as far as what's recorded, is pretty much it. Isn't that something? That was a pretty good warning sign to say, hey, you need to get yourself in line, but he didn't, he didn't take you, did he? Sometimes we don't take well. I, well, I don't know if there's any time that we take well to somebody saying, 
Maybe you need to look at this because you're probably going down a dangerous path. And that's exactly what happened to Uzziah. They go in there and they say, look, you don't need to be doing this. You're overstepping your bounds. This is not necessary. Take a step back. Stand down. Well, he didn't stand down. He brought his weapons up even more, bared down even more. So God was only left with one thing to do. You know what happened to King Uzziah right there? They showed him a mirror. And they said, look at yourself. Just like what the Bible does to us when we read it in James 1, 23 and 24. They took a mirror and they said, look at yourself. Look how you're acting. You know this is wrong. Look at it. And he saw it. And he knew they were right. And I wouldn't even say that he walked away from the mirror and forgot. He just probably just shattered the mirror. He's like, I don't want to hear what you got to say. Because his pride had already set him down a path of destruction that he was not intending on turning around. King Ahab was the same way. The prophet Micaiah was one that, that would, would point out to him where he was wrong and where he needed to correct himself. And Jehoshaphat brought up about Micaiah and looking to his instruction and looking for his guidance. And Ahab said, I don't want to do that because he says things about me that I don't like. And I don't want to hear him. And in fact, I hate him because he tells me the truth. <laughs> and that was his problem, wasn't it? Did he ever do anything personally to harm Ahab? No. The only thing he did to harm him was tell him the truth. And he hated him because he told him the truth. Why do people hate Jesus so much? Why do people get so mad at Stephen when he stood up to talk? It's because they were told the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts. A lot of times it hurts. But in regards to the truth, Jesus says in John 8 and verse 32, the truth, not just in general, but the truth of God, sometimes it hurts, yes, but the truth shall set you free. King Uzziah was given the information he needed right then to save his life, but he rejected it in me. And it cost him. Those who reject godly counsel will inevitably shipwreck their life and their ministry. Same thing happened to those that I was just mentioning that talked to Stephen, or that Stephen was talking to. Notice what it says. When they heard the things that Stephen said to them in regards to Christ and the whole situation there and killing Christ, it's very similar to the, to the same sermon we hear on Pentecost with Peter and the others. Notice what it did. They cut their heart and gnashed at him with their teeth. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. Why do you think they got so mad? Why do you think they stopped their ears? Because they didn't want to hear the truth. And that's what pride will do to us. If we live in pride long enough, we'll get to the point that we don't want to hear the truth anymore and we'll get, go headstrong into the way that we're going and we never listen to what somebody's trying to tell us. Namely, what God's trying to tell us. I'm a firm believer that sometimes God puts people in our lives, maybe at, at the most surprising moments to say, hey, you need to think about how you're acting, or hey, you need to think about the direction of life that you're going down, or you need to think about your attitude. It might just be a, just a stray word that somebody says, but that's God using them to speak to you. Keep your ears open for that. I think we would learn a lot in life if we would just keep our ears open to maybe how God could be using somebody else to maybe get us back on track. And God was using these men here to try to get King Uzziah back where he needed to be. He, the problem was he just didn't want to hear it. And again, his glory was not going to God. And really we can see this as we bring this lesson to our last point. When the consequences of sin no longer bring fear. I want to just ask you something. Let's just kind of make it into a general present day situation. Let's just say that tonight one of us here decides to do something in this worship service that is not right in God's eyes. Okay? It's not pleasing to God. It's not in God's standard. It's not in, the, in, in His will. And immediately we're struck with leprosy. And everybody here, including us, knows why we're struck with leprosy. Because we don't do what's wrong. Is that going to wake us up? I would like to think that it would. But it didn't wake him up. Now, he rushed out of there because he knew he had messed up, and he lived in his isolated house, but it doesn't really seem to be that he ever tried to make amends. I think, I think King Uzziah was sorry, but I also believe that he never repented. Because I believe had he changed and had he strived, had he, had he striven to do better, I believe God could have restored him, but 
It doesn't seem that that existed in his heart. There was real, there was some sorrow there, but not godly sorrow that produces repentance. Maybe there was not enough fear of what the ending was going to be. My friends, we need to have a fear of what it means to not serve God. He knew to refrain from the sanctuary, but he didn't fear God enough to do it. I tell you, a healthy respect for God's power and commands accompanies humility. But those who don't have it, like Uzziah, simply just go further and further down a dangerous path. Pharaoh didn't know God and he didn't care to know God. I have often thought back on the words that he said to Moses in the very beginning. When Moses went in there and he said, Pharaoh, the Lord said, let my people go. And what did he say? He said, I don't know who God is. Who is he? Who is the Lord? And why should I obey his voice? I don't know him and I will not let Israel go. I have often wondered why the waters of, of the Red Sea were closing in on him if he thought, this is God. <laughs> I've often wondered, did that cross his mind? At that point, it was too late. Do we fear the results of not serving God? Or will our pride continue to drive us higher and higher and farther and farther away from God? Look what's said through the prophet Obadiah here. Obadiah chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you strong among nations, and you shall be greatly despised. Notice this in verse 3. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar high as an eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there God says, I will bring you down. We cannot rise to a height in our life that God cannot bring us down from. And rest assured, He will. Because His glory only goes to Him. And as it said through the prophet Isaiah, I will not share my glory with anyone else. Here's the lesson tonight. The Lord fashioned us not for our own glory, but for His. One of the most important questions I think that I have ever been asked, and probably one of the more difficult ones, is why did God create us? That's a loaded question, and I think there's a lot of ways that that can be answered. Everybody may have their own thoughts on it, but I'll give you the most simple one. And that is because God is love, and He wanted somebody that is created in His likeness to hopefully love Him as He loves us. I believe that's why God created us. And in the context of that love and the creation of that love, He expects the glory. That's why we were created. To love God and to give Him glory. He yearns for that. The question is, are we going to do that or are we going to choose otherwise? King Uzziah didn't love God. Maybe he did in the beginning, but he began to love himself more than he loved God. And he fought against God, and that vain, selfish glory is finally what took him down. The question is, are you going to take God's glory away and keep it yourself, or are you going to bow down to God? One more quick analogy in the last one be yours. King Uzziah messed up, and he messed up royally. So did King David. Do you know the difference in the two? Uzziah never said, I'm wrong, God. Uzziah never said, Lord, I'm sorry. He never said, please give me another chance. He just ran out of that temple in pride and in leprosy and never seemed to change. David, on the other hand, he had a lot of pride too. There was times when he went down some bad paths, but when he was showed his wrong, he was very quick to say, Lord, please forgive me. You see, it's not a matter of if we mess up or not. We're going to do that. We're going to have sin in our life. The difference is, are we going to have too much pride to admit it and to do better? Like King Uzziah? Or are we going to be like David and admit our wrongs and humble ourselves before God, give Him the glory, and seek to do better? That's the difference. That's the difference. And in the end, what will really make the difference is that do we really seek to give God glory or are we in it for sin? Inward pride is a battle. Selfish gains and goals will take you away from God. 
failing to rely on God will only push you farther away in rebellion, well, that only hardens the heart. We've got to fear God. And we've got to have a healthy respect for Him. But if we don't, we won't be glorifying Him. And He won't stand for it. There's no exceptions to that. He deserves our glory. And we better be trying to give it to Him with every ounce of energy that we have. So we like King Uzziah. Let's learn a lesson from him. Maybe we are successful. Chances are you probably are. But give him the credit for it and continue to give him the credit for it. And never forget how blessed we are to be his children. Uzziah forgot that. Let's not go down that same path. Appreciate your attention tonight. Hope the lesson was something that would be of benefit to you. Tonight it may be that your pride has been in your way far too long and it's time to change it. We hope that you will. We'd be happy to pray for you and with you in regards to that. If you're not a Christian, you're ready to give your life to the Lord, confessing of your sins, calling on His name and repenting and being willing to be baptized. It's not you can do that. Pride's a dangerous thing. Don't let it stand between you and Him. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?